Detectives. A white cane, a flower that blooms in the dark, and a photograph. Those are the exhibits on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. Even a private detective like me, Jerry Browning, can have his eyes wide open and walk straight into trouble. The automobile traffic on Carver Boulevard was heavy and fast. I stood marooned on the safety island until I spotted the figure of another pedestrian right smack in the path of the oncoming cars. I dashed into the street, darted between the speeding machines, and yanked him back to safety. Then I saw that he was clutching a white cane. The man whose life I'd saved was blind. He told me his name was Clarence Webster. I escorted him back to a large house. Yes, I live here. That is, the owners, Robert and Harold Trent, permit me to live here. I worked with them in their chemical laboratory for many years until, through Robert Trent's carelessness, there was an explosion and I lost my eyesight, my means of livelihood. Webster talked as if these things had been locked up inside him for a long time. When I came out of the hospital, Robert and Harold told me I could share their home for as long as I live. They mean well, but sometimes, like this evening, I feel I just must get away. So I take a walk. Webster was interrupted by the opening of the house door. A man in a disheveled dressing gown leaned out. Webster, what are you doing out in the street? Who's that with you? This is Mr. Browning, a gentleman who saved my life. May I ask him in, Robert? There's something I'd like him to see. I should have refused Robert's curt nod, but my curiosity got the better of me. What could a blind man want me to see? I saved a blind man from being hit by an automobile. And when I brought him home, he said he wanted me to see something. It was a conservatory filled with rare and fragrant flowers. Webster moved lovingly among them. His fingers pointed straight at the largest, flashiest flowers. It was hard to realize that the blaze of color was nothing but solid blackness to him. Webster seemed to know what I thought. Don't pity me, Mr. Browning. I enjoy these flowers just as much as any man. Lack of sight is some compensations. I can appreciate this beauty through a sense of smell and touch. He walked to a table on which stood the spiniest, most vicious-looking plant I've ever seen. I don't touch this one, however. I'll bet you don't. What is it? An extremely rare variety of night-blooming cereus. A member of the great cactus family, Selenocereus grandiflorus. Quite a botanical curiosity. Blooms in the dark, shrivels and falls off after a few hours in the light. The blossoms are, I believe, pure white. And the fragrance is superb. Oh, you must stop in some midnight. Webster, I'm sure Mr. Browning has more important things to do than humor you and your crazy hobby. I turned to face the speaker, Robert Trent, whom I'd seen when we came in. His cold eyes were on Webster's sightless ones. Webster advanced toward him, brandishing his cane. Robert, when you talk like that, I, I could kill you. I don't know what might have happened next if another man hadn't walked into the room. He was a younger, gentler edition of Robert, obviously Harold Trent. Webster introduced us. I left as soon after as I could. Harold took me to the door. Don't mind Robert's gruffness, Mr. Browning. Clarence is a sort of irritant to him because Robert was responsible for the, well, accident that blinded him. I guess a psychiatrist would call it a guilt complex. Sometimes I'm sorry I persuaded Robert to bring Webster here. But where else could the guy go? I couldn't answer that one, so I said goodnight, went on home, tried to forget the whole thing. But two days later, I had a visitor in my office. It was Robert Trent, and he looked scared to death. Mr. Browning, you may think it curious that I come to you for help after my rudeness the other evening. I was greatly disturbed then, and now I'm terribly worried. Okay, Mr. Trent, let's have it. What's bothering you? I'm afraid I'm the victim of a scheme conceived a long time ago. I haven't time to go into details now, but believe me, Mr. Browning, my home harbors a dangerous man. You must get Webster away from there, and quickly. I don't care how you do it or what it costs, but I want him out of there. That was the last time I saw Robert Trent alive. About 1 a.m., I got a call from Lieutenant Dawson of Homicide to come down to headquarters at once. Jerry, you're wanted as a witness. Robert Trent's been killed about half an hour ago. His brother Hale stumbled over the body in the conservatory. Robert was beaten to death. With a cane? Dawson nodded unhappily. Yeah? The blind man's cane. Webster hated Robert, often threatened him. Hale says you heard one of those threats. You'll have to testify to it, Jerry. 
Uh, Webster's in the other room. Will you talk to him? I shook my head. After the things Robert had intimated that afternoon in my office, what I had to say to or about the blind man was strictly for the ears of the grand jury. There weren't many witnesses, a maid in the Trent household, a delivery boy. They'd both heard Robert Trent behave in a provoking manner, after which Webster had threatened to kill him. Harold Trent took the stand. I was always fond of Webster, and I'm sure he didn't mean to kill Robert. My brother was difficult to live with. I realized that, tried to make up to Webster by studying conservatory for him, something to putter around with, take his mind off his affliction. Do I believe Webster's guilty? Yes, I do. But he had every reason to kill my brother. Robert goaded him beyond endurance. I wondered if Harold thought he was helping Webster's case. The clerk called the next witness, me. I was sworn in, told how I'd met Webster, then about Robert's visit to my office. Look at these photographs, Mr. Browning. They were taken by the police within an hour after Harold Trent stumbled upon his brother's body in the dark. Do you recognize that blood-stained murder weapon? I recognized it. And then I recognized something else. This is Mr. Webster's cane, but that's not what's important in the photograph. I know the grand jury's impaneled to hear evidence against the defendant. Just the same, I'd like to do a highly unorthodox thing. I want to offer this photograph as proof of the defendant's innocence. I took the picture over to the jury. There's a flower in this photograph. A rare variety of the night-blooming cereus. A plant that blossoms in the dark. This photograph shows those blossoms already shriveled and about to fall off. This means that the plant was exposed to light for several hours, which also means that Robert Trent was killed in a lighted room. Yet his brother says it was dark. Do you know why? Because Harold Trent knows very well that a blind man would not need light to commit murder, would in fact need darkness as an advantage over his victim. Harold Trent cracked. He admitted he deliberately set that explosion years back was afraid Webster had seen him even then trying to kill his brother, whom he hated. It was a full confession. And it got Harold full punishment, the chair. Like I said, sometimes you have to work in the dark to bring the truth to light. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. 